Alan Burke, uh, he's the director of Anertech. He sent a presentation last week to us on our Slack saying, uh, this is how you give a tech talk. So uh, I put it on and I watched maybe three, four minutes of a half an hour and it looked fantastic. There was videos, there was audio, there was drama. Um, uh, it was like Vitaly's presentation last night, you know, really top class stuff. But beside that was um, uh, a YouTube suggested video of how to give a you didn't see this one here, okay? Uh, how to give a tech talk. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it said, um, don't talk about yourself. You know, people have the, the blurb, they know who you are, they've come to listen to you. No point in saying that your name is Mark Conroy because people know your name and no point in saying you're a lead front end developer with Anertech or Anertech or Ireland's web agency of the year. We win lots of awards lots of times. There's no point in mentioning these things because you probably know them already. Uh, there's no point in saying that you're an admin on the Drupal Twig Slack channel and if you're interested in front-end Drupal development, you should get onto that because there's a lot of help there for a lot of people. Um, there's no point in mentioning that you're interested in Drupal for good because, well, everyone's interested in Drupal for good. I'm a member of the Drutopia team, I'm a member of the Beyond the Cyclist team, I maintain some very, very unpopular modules and one theme that is so bad I've never even installed it myself on my own websites. Uh, it's a port of the WordPress 2017 team. I was going to uh, port one website, one WordPress team per week. I failed. Uh, I'm Mark Conroy on Twitter, so if you want to, uh, I don't know, not have a very good Twitter experience, you feel free to follow me. Um, okay, that was supposed to be a joke. I'm supposed to start with an interesting story. Uh, that's how you. That's how you give a good talk. Apparently, you start with an interesting story. But I'm a developer, and developers don't have interesting stories. We're all boring people. So this is a, as, as, as good as I could come up with. And it's got nothing to do with Drupal, but it has the word open source in it. So I thought, that will do. Uh, I tend to speak fast, and sometimes I get excited and I speak even faster. So if I speak too fast, maybe put your hand up. And actually, <laughs> I probably think you're asking a question then. I don't know, you can t tell me to slow down somehow. Um, OK, this is me. <laughs> and we've just won a contract here. So we're fairly happy because it's going to be a six-week contract. So we, we know we've got at least six weeks left in the company before we're bankrupt. Uh, and I think, wow, yeah, here we go, another, another good website. Let's, uh, let's start being a code monkey. So I start working. And I'm banging away on the keyboard, building, well, that's our own website there, that's already built. And uh, this is going well, I think. I'm not sure why I started doing my code before we get the designs and whatnot. Then I realized, ah, this is one of those tenders where we win the contract to build the website. Somebody else wins the contract to design the website. Great, so we'll have to work with whatever designs we get from them, but you know, it's, it's okay, they're, they're professionals and whatnot. They tell us they're using Photoshop. <coughs> I said, they tell us they're using Photoshop. So I'm not very happy with this. You know, uh, they're, they're using a photo editor to design a website. But I have an idea. I have an idea. I, I, I think there's a better way to design websites. I certainly think there's a better way to deliver the designs to our clients. So whatever, using Photoshop to design it, certainly to deliver the designs, we, 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 we have a plan. So a brief outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to, actually, I'm going to start off with a quite familiar story, so I'm, I'm going to do that part right, maybe. Then why not use Photoshop? And by Photoshop, I don't mean just Photoshop. I mean, that's one of them. I, I mean Photoshop, I mean Sketch, I mean sending PDFs, uh, any of those static mock-up um, applications. Uh, then very, very quickly, rapid prototyping, pen and paper, balsamic, Sketch app, that kind of stuff. And then we get into a brief overview of atomic design and Pattern Lab, and then specifically how we can integrate Pattern Lab with Drupal and how that can make people, if not happy, happier, or how at least we don't have surprises for, uh, for our clients that, that the website that gets delivered at the end is actually the exact same as the designs that they saw. It's not an approximation of it, it's not kind of like the designs, it's not almost like the designs, it will be the exact same uh, pixel for pixel for the designs. So, does this sound familiar? Someone designs a website, either we do it in-house or somebody else who wants a contract for the design designs the website and the client eventually signs off on them after going through a number of iterations. And then you go and build a website based on these designs. 
you think you build a website based on these designs, and it looks quite like the designs. It's not exactly like them. It's not what they call pixel perfect. You know, these designers that go not these designers, well, these designers that go on with their pixel perfect lark. Uh, it, it's 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 almost pixel perfect. There's a few things out here, a few things out there, simply because screen sizes maybe change. Um, and that's not your fault. You know, it's not your fault that the CEO is on IE8. It's not your fault that uh, the designer designs on a 22-inch monitor, and it's not your fault that the client looked at it on an iPad. Those screens are just different size widths. Um, but that's not the client's fault either. The client isn't a professional. You're, you're the professional. They hired you to build it. They hired designers to design it. If they could do it themselves, they probably would. So it's not your fault. It's not the client's fault. But damn it, it's some. Someone edited my uh, slide. It's someone's fault. So let's see if we can um, if we can fix this. Here's here's the problem. The problem is in the real world, websites use real content. So not every headline is lorem ipsum dollar sit. Amit. <laughs> Building a website recently for uh, uh, a client of ours, rather than giving away too much de detail, uh, every title had five words in it. I said to designers, what are you going to happen, what are you going to do when uh, there's more than five words in the title? And the designer said, we are going to train them to write short titles. <laughs> I said, the, the longest word in a title has five letters. The designer said, yes, we're going to train them to have short, snappy titles. I said, the client has five words in their name. On the day the website goes live, they're going to use those five words to say, that is the client's name. Those five words plus launches a new website. Day one, we have broken the website because they cannot write a five-word title for that when their name alone has five words in it. So we're going to use real content. You know, some of this content is going to go into two lines. Some of this content won't have an image in the teaser because it's just a brief notice to say that there's a meeting or something on. Um, not everything will fit into this lovely grid. So designs then with Photoshop and with Sketch and things like that, they're, they're, they're just static images. They're, they're an approximation. They're, 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 they're what we are aiming towards when we build a website, but they're just an image. It's just a photograph of it. You know, you need to get the actual thing itself in your hands to, 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 to live it and experience it and know this is the website that will be built. So you don't come to Athens, you know, to see a photo of the Acropolis. Now, as it happens, <laughs> I came to Athens and the only thing I wanted to see was the Acropolis. And I've had to work, I got here on Wednesday day early, two days early, I had to work all day Wednesday and Wednesday night and we had to work all day Thursday to launch a, a site. And uh, we're going to the Acropolis tonight, I thought, but it's apparently the Acropolis Museum. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, so these kind of designs, they're, they're, they're built in what I'll say is my ha most hated design tool, that's Photoshop. So, this is uh, uh, actually created in Photoshop, because Photoshop is good at this, it's good at creating images. Uh, these are actual layers from a Photoshop design that we received. One of them you can see is called dot .doc1. Now, that's quite difficult to do because, you know, if that's from a Word document that they got it, that has lowercase characters. Someone had to actually delete the extension and re-put it in with uppercase characters to annoy me. They've got a heading called subheading two. I have no idea what subheading two is in this context. I have no idea what rectangle nine is, except that it looks very close to rectangle eight. Uh, layer three uh, looks quite close to layer 29. And object title lorem ipsum dollar lorem looks like document one, which is not dot doc one. So this kind of confusion is tricky with Photoshop, that, that it's, it's, a, it's easy to create all these layers and create all these groups, but it's harder to put names on them. It's harder to actually make them make sense to a developer who has to come and build the damn thing uh, three months after you've designed it and you've forgotten why something is called something or why everything is called the way it is. Here's a design we got last week, uh, a slice from, from, a, from a Photoshop. So we have a group, and inside the group we have a group, and, and we've got a rectangle, and we've got a design devising an integrated implement of a broken layer. And then we've got a rectangle and a group and a about, and a group and a group and a path and a group, uh, something that will identify the client. So I blacked it out. Uh, client, a client, and uh, sorry, a group, a group, and a group. I haven't got a clue what's in any of these things. And it takes a while to go down through them and try to figure things out. So this is not helping the front end developer. It's, it's just, it's not a good tool for websites. So it's a great tool for editing photos. It's, the name is, or the, the, um, the point is in the name. 
Photoshop is for editing photographs. You get a photograph of the Acropolis and you make the sun darken a bit and you make the clouds disappear and you make it look really, really well. You win WordPress photo awards and things like that. Um, it's not for designing websites. Uh, one example recently, again, a client said was, this website looks different in uh, Chrome than it looks in uh, designs. I said, yeah, we're using desktop font and we're using a web font. It's the same font, but Photoshop renders them one way and Chrome renders them another way. Well, this was revelatory to the client and they weren't happy. They wanted to look like the designs. I wanted to look like the designs, but there's nothing I can do. Then they looked at it in Firefox. Of course, Firefox renders fonts slightly differently as well. Um, so, you know, it, 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 there's only so much we can do. And the more we can work in the browser, the more we can, we can deliver for the client what the client's expecting. Um, if you want to make a minor change in Photoshop, it's not very sustainable. I'm going to explain that in a moment. Um, and uh, before that, I get three more reasons why I don't like Photoshop. And again, it's not just Photoshop. I don't want to be hating on Photoshop, but I do want to be hating on Photoshop too much. Um, but it's also Sketch and, and uh, other apps. So number one, it's not responsive. You will probably receive more designs for a desktop than you will for a mobile. Can I get a show of hands? How many people get more designs for desktop than mobile? Look at that, ridiculous. And more than 50% of your users are going to be on mobile. So you should be getting more than 50% of your designs for mobile first. So we're all mobile first, but it's actually mobile first after desktop. Um, so again, recently with a client of ours, the client with the five names, we got 46 Photoshop files, over 300 megabytes of Photoshop in my Dropbox. Um, 40 of them were for uh, desktop, six were for mobile. Zero were for tablet. Tablet is an app that It'll be somewhere between uh, desktop and mobile. Again, whatever that means. And then you come up with, okay, your homepage has this little three panels, of course. Every homepage has three little panels somewhere on it. What happens out on a mobile? Do we get two on top and one stretching? Do we squash them in? You know, we, 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 we can't see these with Photoshop. We can't see these with, with static designs. Um, designers then will, will, will design with one um, specific browser so, sorry, the designs will be for one specific browser size. So if they give you designs and they're 960 pixels wide, first question is, can you tell me what happens when this is 1,700 pixels wide? If they give you designs under 1,700 pixels wide, is that a full 100% width background or is it, does the image uh, in the hero have a ratio? And of course it has a ratio, so it's got you know 16 to nine ratio, that's fine. I turn on my 22-inch monitor and it's massive, it takes up the whole screen. Oh, it's too big, it needs to be maximum 700 pixels. Okay, but you need to keep the ratio still. Yes. How do we keep a ratio when you've got a max height? And how can Photoshop explain this to us? It can't. So designers design in you know, bigger and bigger screens, 27-inch iMac monitors. Users use on smaller and smaller screens on our iPhone 5s and things like that, and never the twain shall meet. So designers want this big experience, users just want functionality. And again, using Photoshop, we don't give them that experience. All we give them is a visual approximation of what it might be like. Um, designs then get zoomed out. So you, you send a PDF or you send a Photoshop file or whatever it is to the, to the client. The first thing you do is they'll start hitting uh, command minus to make it smaller, smaller, smaller so they can see the whole thing in one page or they'll, God forbid, <laughs> they'll print it off in an A3 sheet. Um, who looks at a website like that? The pixel, pixel size is down to about one pixel, maybe two pixels. Uh, it can't be read. So what you need to do is let people see these things in the real environment. Send them a URL of this is what your website's gonna look like. And if they happen to look at it on a phone, they'll see what it's gonna look like on a phone. If they happen to look at it on a, uh, a tablet, they'll see what it looks like on a tablet. And if they happen to look at it on a desktop, you can guess what's gonna happen. Uh, realistically, they should only be able to see the above the fold items first. They shouldn't get this zoomed out look and see the, like, you know, the whole website, the header, the footer, because nobody will experience the website like that. The third reason is too easy for bonkers ideas. Um, here's three examples of things I have been asked for by clients. Uh, and I, I, I preface that with not by clients of our present, of, of Anatech that I presently work, work with, just when I was uh, freelancing and when I was working privately as a, Seven-play person for smaller clients. Number one is when you click this link here, so they got a link on their website. It opens a Wikipedia article about that, but Wikipedia has to be themed like our website because we want to use our team colors. No problem at all. I'm going to fire up Photoshop. I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like, and you can send that to the developers and tell them to do it. <laughs> That's easy for a designer to do, and Photoshop is a great tool for doing that. But 
done deal is the Irish version of eBay. A client came to me, uh, sells stoves and fireplaces and things like that, and uh, I don't like our website on done deal. And I said, you don't have a website on done deal. He goes, we do, we have an e-commerce website. I said, I built your website, I know there's no e-commerce on it. He said, yeah, we have an e-commerce website on done deal. Well, are you placing ads on done deal? Are you selling things on eBay, basically? Yes, right. Done deal is all brown though, Mark. Our color scheme is orange and blue. Can you change that for us? Nope, I don't own done deal, I don't own eBay, I can't change it. But we're not happy with it, you have to do something. You know, we're paying you to, uh, I don't own done deal, there's nothing I can do. A designer can do that in Photoshop, no problem, give it to me and you can insist that I do it, I still can't do it. So when we were finished doing that and having that conversation, he then said to me, okay, right, grand. We don't like the look of our website on Facebook. <sighs> when you click this button, we need lens flare. You know, again, that's simple in Photoshop, but it's, it's damn hard to, uh, to code. So I think maybe I'm just doing something wrong, and I need to contact Sheik. Sheik uh, sent me an email just this morning. He has post-stress uh, disorder. He wanted to convert that to HTML. He's an expert at it, so maybe Sheik has the answer. He says he's going to uh, convert PSD to HTML static and make it responsive. Well, that'll be the first time I've encountered Photoshop's uh, files getting responsive. So I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or Sheik, Sheik is doing something right, but uh, I might be replying to him. So what's better? Well, Sketch App is better. It's faster. Its file size is smaller. Um, it's got a more intuitive interface. It, it just does the things that designers really want rather than, than lots and lots of different things. Um, it's a beautiful tool to work with. I, I, I absolutely find it fantastic. It's great for building UIs. But at the end of the day, ultimately, it fails for the same reasons Photoshop does. It still outputs a static image of what the website might look like when you're finished developing it. The next screen here is a, an image of a quick mock-up I did of uh, our internal task timer. And I've no idea why I put it there. So I've nothing to say about it. <laughs> now, does anyone know who Clark Volberg is? One person. Can you stay quiet? And you, and you, please, don't ruin my joke. <laughs> Clark doesn't like InVision. He thinks it's a very bad experience to use. Does anyone agree with Clark that it's a bad experience to use InVision? Just that many, okay. Clark, and of course, Anatech, look at that. Thanks, lads. <laughs> Uh, Clark Volberg is the CEO of Envision, and I tweeted there a while back, more often than not, it's a shit experience Envision app is loading for me. And Clark said, uh, unfortunately, you are correct, sir. I'm all over it. Expect significant improvements soon. And fair play, then they followed up with a few more emails and things to me to see when they could have an interview or a chat about how uh, my experience of Envision could be better. And short of winding up the company, I don't see a point in talking to them. So the solution for me is design in the browser. This talk was called uh, Back to the Future. In the past, in the present even still, we had HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the old school tools of the web. And I'm saying, let's go back to them. Let's just use them. They're perfectly fine, because at some stage in the web build process, you are going to have to write the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript. So why not do it at the design phase rather than at the uh, implementation phase? Let's not send PSDs and PDFs to our clients and instead let's send a URL. So if you want to use Photoshop as your internal tool, if you want to use Sketch as your internal tool, that's not a problem. I have no problem with our designer sitting down beside me with Sketch and saying, right, this is the UI we're going to build, Mark. Here's what the header is going to be like. What do you think? All oh, great. Yeah, fantastic. I'll implement that. I'll implement that in Pattern Lab, or I'll implement that in a static HTML mockup. But what I will send to the client will be a URL. And they can click on the URL the same as they click on the URL to open an Envision experience. Um, except they'll see the actual website. So you open up a, an Envision um, link on a mobile phone, and it's the desktop uh, designs you're looking at. You're going to see the desktop version on your phone. If you open up the um, mobile uh, views on Envision on your desktop, you're going to see the mobile views. That's not, that's not good enough. So you send a URL. If they open on their phone, they'll see a responsive website. They'll see a small screen version of the website. On a tablet, medium size, and on desktop, the large version. 
And you have to do this at some stage. So it actually saves you time to just get it done in the earlier stages. So here's the solution, really. You do some discovery, find out what your client wants. Usually that's bull, because they don't know what, really what they want, except they want a new website. They've got their internal processes and their marketing department want everything on the front page and things like that. So then you do the actual research where you talk to your client's users. That's what your client actually wants, what the users need the website to do. Then do some rapid prototyping. Get out your pen and paper, draw a few little quick sketches. Yep, that looks good. Let's try something like that. Um, use some post-it notes. Go to stage two of rapid prototyping, maybe use balsamic or sketch or something just to give very quick wireframes, definitions, and things like that of um, the kind of approach we're thinking of for this website. Is there going to be uh, a header with a logo on the left-hand side and a search bo uh, box on the right-hand side? Of course, it's on every website. Is there going to be a slider? Yeah, there is going to be a slider. It's going to have loads of images in it. And it's going to make the website slow. But you can at least get those things out of the way so you know the things you have to build. Then you agree on the design components. And Perhaps take an atomic design approach. You don't have to take an atomic design approach, but, but, but perhaps do. And I'm going to guess everyone here at this stage has heard of Pattern Lab and, and that, so I won't go through atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, pages. That's, um, I, I presume it's, it's, has everyone heard of it, yeah? Uh, but with Drupal, we, we, we need to match these things up. So we, we want to write the front end, but we only want to do it once. We don't want to write the front end in Pattern Lab and then rewrite it all in Drupal. Or, or, you know, write most of it in Pattern Lab and some of it in Drupal. Let's keep everything in Pattern Lab and uh, let Drupal do its magic in, in the CMS layer. So basically, you create a component, component designs in Pattern Lab. You create a card uh, component and you create a header component and you create a home page uh, layout component, things like that. In Drupal, then you create, you go to your templates folder and you, for each component you've got in Pattern Lab, you create a corresponding file in Drupal and one maps uh, one, one to the other. And then, the client will eventually sign off on these designs that they see, and when they sign off on the designs, they will have signed off on your Drupal team. There's a bit of Drupal teaming work maybe still be done, but it, in general, that's the team done and finished. So usually where you get uh, the designs and the back-enders build the website, then the front-enders come in and do their, um, do their front-end work, and then the QA starts and things like that. that. That gets scrapped, and we start QA really at stage one, and where the client f signs off in stage two or three, uh, well, that's finished. You, you, your your front enders can uh, can retire early. So this is a very simple example. Now it's ugly, and it's deliberately ugly just so we can we can actually see how, th how things map. So on the top, we've got Pattern Lab with some dummy data, five menu items, home about us, our work blog, and contact. And on the bottom, <coughs> sorry, on the bottom then we've got uh, the same uh, styles coming in, but it uses Drupal's real data um, with home articles, Pattern Lab, safe email, test article, and contact us. So we can see that whether we want to add an extra menu item, that's not going to break. Our designs are flexible enough to handle this kind of thing. Pattern Lab has set up uh, its systems, and Drupal set up its, and they can talk one-to-one. -one. Going a bit further then than just uh, main menu, if you add in, say, a branding block, so you've got the name Anertec and the slogan Web Design Perfected. And you can see top and bottom, they are both pixel for pixel identical. So everything is exactly as it should be. So when the client looks at the top one and says, yep, that's the header we want. Well, that's the header that they're going to get. There we go a little bit further. There's a picture of us winning loads of awards. Um, and you can see that the title of the Pattern Lab on the left and the title of the article from Drupal on the right have the exact same font in the exact same place and the exact same size. They both have the same underline and things like that on the image. The text sizes are the same in both and the header is all the same. So you're, you're mapping exactly one for one what, 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 what's in the designs with what Drupal is going to output. So here's some simple code. If you want to work out how to do this very easily, the, the, the cheater's guide to it is, uh, on the left-hand side, I've got a menu called horizontal-menu.twig, and that has the code from main-menu.html.twig. So it's just the code from Drupal's menu uh, file. So now I know that the, the code in the pattern lab is going to be the exact same as the code in Drupal. How do I know that? Because I stole it from Drupal. Um, actually, I asked a question earlier on about having uh, two blocks of things in, the, in different places and how you might uh, get name conventions. And I see I have menu underscore underscore horizontal here. So I, I did the right thing, I think. So that's, that's the menu, as you can see here on the top. And in Drupal, all we do is say that the main, uh, sorry, menu hyphen hyphen main dot HTML dot twig just includes the file it finds upper, upstream in, uh, in Pattern Lab. The same then with the branding block, we write the code that Drupal's going to output in, in, into uh, Pattern Lab, 
and then we'll extend that in, uh, in Drupal, in the block system branding block file. Uh, the article one then, same thing, we get some nice clean HTML, has an article title, article image, article body, and article tags, and we'll map that then with uh, the, the node hyphen hyphen article hyphen hyphen full at html.twig. And what we do then is say that, that, that what we've called title in Pattern Lab, Drupal uses the um, variable label. What we've called body in Pattern Lab, Drupal uses the content.body field, and so on with the other fields. Now there's one little issue that we'll have with this, which is that the Pattern Lab one is always going to find an image, because in our JSON file we'll have said there is an image here, which means you're going to have an empty image div in Drupal, and you don't want that. The other problem you're going to see will be that all the Drupal attributes that we have the data attributes and the quick edit links and things like that that, that make Drupal 8 so helpful for accessibility, they're all gone because we don't have the attributes array. So to fix that, here's a component called a card. So on the left, I've wrapped my stuff with if statements. So it's if there's a title, then we get a H2 and put in the title. If there's an image, we put in the image. And on the opposite side of that, sorry, and, and on line 17, you can see we do have the attributes um, um, array in there. So we, we, we'll continue to have all that goodness from Drupal for ourselves. And then in Drupal, I've, this one is a little bit more compli complicated. What I've done is said that if we're using paragraphs module, so if paragraph uh, the field card title has a value, so if there's something in that, then create a new variable called card title, and the same then with the uh, text and the image and the call to action fields. And then I swap those new variables, so then title becomes card title, text becomes card text, and so on. So that allows us to keep all the greatness of the Drupal 8 accessibility and that attributes and things like that, it allows us to use um, Pattern Lab, and it also allows us to have fields not filled in. So if a car doesn't have an image, we don't get empty divs. So why is this such a good approach? Well, it's such a good approach because this is sustainable. So on the left, um, this is what normally happens with Photoshop and things like that. The client doesn't like the background color on buttons, asks you to change it, and you go through their, your 200 layers on 46 files and change the background color of the button on every one of those. That takes a while. The designer charges by the hour, and he retires young. On the other side of that, the client doesn't like the uh, background color on buttons. The developer changes the CSS for dot button, and that's one line of one line of code gets changed, and the developer needs to stay working for another while because you can't change you can't charge too much for uh, 30 seconds work. So the sustainability of using design in a browser, of, of using Pattern Lab, or using any um, any uh, 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 generation tools, let's say, rather than using uh, Photoshop, is fantastic. Why is it good? It's good because we got some uh, QA done very early, early on. So rather than us building the website and asking the client, will you sign off on each component as we're, design as, as we're building it? And they always say yes. And when you ask them to do some testing, they're always busy. And then they tell you, we want to test the whole homepage in one go, please, not just individual parts. We want to test the whole about section. Um, so usually what it en ends up meaning is that the QA comes in near the end of the process. And at that stage, you've spent the budget and you haven't built what the client was expecting, but you have built what you thought the client was expecting. Um, when, when we do this, it takes longer, it costs more money, and eventually we get the sign off and the site goes live. With a design in the browser kind of approach, same thing, designer designs the website, but this time we'll use the browser to deliver the designs. So it may have been designed in Sketch or Photoshop or whatever, but it will be delivered as a URL. The client will test the device, the designs on a real device, or so whatever device they happen to be using, that's what they'll see it on. So they won't see a photograph of the website which will look perfect on IE8 or, or, or Windows 97, whatever they're, they're using, it will, and look the exact same on every device. So they'll see the real thing, and the finished design is the finished front end. And I think that's really important, and I think that's, that's, that's really what we should be aiming towards, that, that we get this QA out of the way as quickly as possible, and that the backend developers can be working on, on, on whatever they need to do to output the classes that we've, we've developed for them. Why is it so good? Well, we've got a living style guide. You tell a client, uh, where's your style guide? We don't have one. Can we build you one? Yeah, you can. How much is it going to cost? Well, it's you know 10 days of work. They're not going to pay for that. If you use something like Pattern Lab, well, you have no choice but to build a style guide. You, you basically build a style guide by accident. Um, so at the end of, at the end of, I'll keep going. At the end of the design process, the client has a style guide that they can, that they can follow. Now you, you, you might wonder, okay, I've got smaller clients and 
they, they don't have the budget for the whole pattern lab experience, let's say we have to design every single type of button for them and every heading style and all that. Well, if you want a cheaper way of doing that for yourself, don't style every button individually and in inherit them into the molecules and into the, into the um, organisms and things like that. Just create one file called header and stick everything that's gonna go into the header into that one file and style that. That's starting to get towards design in the browser for you. Another file then called card, and put all the card stuff into it. Um, another one called login form, you can have your login form and your input and your buttons, and that all go into the one place. And when you get back to refactoring parts of it, then you know when there's more budget, you can start abstracting those a bit. But there, there should be nothing wrong with uh, creating those components as full standalone components rather than um, uh, built up patterns, let's say. If you're looking for a slightly easier way to, to get started on it. Um, What's this one here, the style guys not updated? Yeah, this was another one we had. We, we got designs three months later. My Dropbox notification said there's uh, new files in Dropbox and they were called designs updated. And there was a style guide created somewhere in the middle of the original designs and the designs updated. So what we built didn't look like the style guide. We had different fonts and different colors. What was in the style guide didn't look like the updated designs but the client wanted something in the middle of all of those. So you know, if, if, you, if you do design in the browser kind of stuff, you update things once, again, you've got no choice but to be working with the most up-to-date style guide then because th there's no other way you can work. And you've got your Git history, so you can go back and see how things work if, if you want to change things. Regression testing, we use static data when, when, when we use this kind of approach because if we were to output JSON from Drupal and use that in our, in our pattern lab, that would be great and you could see exactly what the most up-to-date content looks like. But if you've got, say, a listing page of events, every event has a date. Uh, when you go back to do some regression testing, if you add a new component, the dates will have changed. So your regression test is going to fail. If you've got a slider on the, on the home page and that slider has a Christmas promotion on it, well, you do your regression testing a month later and it could be a promotion for uh, summer holidays. Again, your regression test is going to fail because the images will look different. Now, they're easy fails. You can say, oh, that's just the image. That's just the date. But we prefer to use static content, um, real content, but static. So it's, let's say, 10 sample blog posts from the client's website. So it would be actual, the actual type of content the client will be using. Um, yeah, so 30 minutes, thank you. So a new design component gets added, looks great, and then three weeks later, something has broken, and the CEO has a heart attack. With regression testing, a new design component gets added. Each pre-existing component is automatically tested against um, the static, the, 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 the snapshots we have taken of it. And Pattern Lab is great for having a, a feature called, I think it's called Ancestry, where any component you have, if it's say, if it's an organism, it will tell you the molecules that make up this component are this and this and this. So you know if you change that organism, you may break these molecules or atoms. And then it also tells you further up the chain that this organism is used by uh, the following templates or the following pages. So it's, it's got that great an ancestry to let you know that, that this might break the following things. Um, so each, each component then can get tested and make sure nothing breaks, and then three weeks later, the CEO, I'm glad to say, is still in good health. And everyone is happy. Drupal Camp Dublin is on October 20th and 21st in October. Kate Mila Falcha, you are all very welcome to Ireland. Do you have any questions? Matthew, back. Um, so you mentioned that you use Photoshop and Sketch as an internal tool. Uh, yeah, we used a very similar approach for creating like. Uh, uh, components for clients. Uh, we don't use Pattern Lab, but we use KSS, but it's yep. kind of a similar approach still. Uh, so one of the problems that we have is um, the fact that uh, the way we work with the clients usually is that we try to deliver something as early as possible uh, so that we can catch the possible failures as early as possible so that they, so that it's cheap to fail. Yep. Uh, is there any other tools than Photoshop or Sketch that you would suggest for creating the designs? Because if they are not very good for the responsive, but we still would like still would like to be able to demonstrate at least on some level at that point the, the responsiveness of of the <coughs> not that design. I know of and not that I would want to use because you you're failing early using Sketch and they don't they won't like it or whatever, you can change it, but they're you're gonna have a bigger failure if you give them things in Sketch and then you build what you think they're expecting and it's different. 
So I, I wouldn't like to use anything that's... That, all I want to do is hand over a URL, and I, I, I can't imagine... At the moment, no, I can't imagine how, how we can bridge that gap. So, um, because of, it seems like it's uh, very late in the process that you are now uh, discussing with the client about what is the end result or what is the design going to be like? Do you build something like um, no, 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 wireframes no. or? Yeah, that, that's what I was saying about the, the, the rapid prototyping. We, 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 we do our pens, we do our papers, our post-it notes, uh, you know, uh, flip charts and those kind of things. That's fine. Uh, we'll use Balsamic or maybe Sketch for, for quick wireframes and that. Uh, but the actual components, we, it, it, it doesn't take long to write some HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So if, if someone creates a header or a slider, you, know, you, can, you can probably grab code from somewhere else and, and slot, it, slot it in. Yeah, uh, so what I've seen is that maybe in a sketch you can make like a, something quick in, in a day, but I think it's three times more at least if you, if you do in HTML. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's just that we are not as good in HTML and CSS. Perhaps I'm I'm willing to take the, the hit on the, the extra bit of time. Yeah, I, I, I think we're, we're we're making bigger problems for ourselves when we when we don't do that. Okay, I, I think we, we you might get better quicker results for some parts, of it, but you, I think you got you get bigger failures. I certainly we we found bigger failures at the end when when we were handing over what we think is a great website and the client says that's not doing the things we wanted it to do. And you, you've got to start reverse engineering things then. I don't know, uh, it seems like also that the problem that we are having is slightly different because of, I haven't really had uh, uh, the same problem with having the uh, delivering sketch designs or Photoshop designs that uh, we would have to um, like. I, I'd say, Laurie, we probably are having maybe a slightly different discussion with each other at the moment because for us, a lot of our work is, is building the websites rather than the design. It's because a lot of say, government contracts that we work with, there's two tenders. One is to be design and one is to be builders. So for us, a lot of it would actually be that They've gone through this process, and they've gotten the sketch version of it, and then we have to build it. You know, so we, we, we actually don't do very much design ourselves. Oh uh, yeah. So when we do, this is how we want to deliver it. But we, we're, we're we're getting more design work, but we're we're kind of early in the design uh, industry. Let's say. Well, I think that that makes sense then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, hello. I would like to clarify something. Uh, yeah. Um, you have mentioned uh, uh, the designer in both, in uh, one case, um, have, having to change the, um, the design, and in the other case, to have to change the component. Uh, these two designers are not the same. The one is a designer who designs uh, in... Photoshop or in Sketch or something. Yes. And the other is a themer. Yes. Actually, uh, how does this work in uh, real case scenarios? It's no different than how we pre how people presently work because at the moment you get a designer who uses Photoshop and you get a themer who does the front end. Same thing, we can get a designer who who will design component based wise, uh, still maybe using Photoshop or Sketch, and a front end or then to implement it. So it's it's just that 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 I'm trying to get people to deliver. Uh, what the finished product is going to look like sooner, but you, you still need two people. Unless you got you get you have a, someone uh, who is a designer developer that that can do design and development at the same time. That, but it's very rare you get that. So yeah, we're, we're we're happy to to say yeah we still need to pay a designer to design it using whatever they feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. and then we still have to pay the front end developer to implement it like we always had to. So we yeah there's, it it doesn't it doesn't uh, it it hasn't yet saved money for uh, in that sense. Except that, we, except that we get the QA done quicker and, and signed off faster. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Questions? Hey, Mark. Hi, Boris. Um, question. These pattern labs that you, pattern libraries that you use, is that one library for an attack, or do you, you create a library per site? How does it work? Can you rephrase the question? Yeah, so you use a pattern lab, right, with all yep. these quick files and all these small components? Yes. I'm not used to this to this scenario, but do you create one, do you have like like one set of patterns that you reuse for every website that you create, like an Anatech based one? No. Or do no, you we, create we, one like for yeah, every Yeah, we, we use the phase two pattern lab implementation. Uh -huh. um, we, we would hope that there will be patterns built up that if someone said to us, okay, we like the design of the slider on your Oxfam site, we like the design of the carousel on your Ireland.ie site, mm -hmm. we could take each directory from those, drop them into the new pattern lab, let's say. But each, each instance will be the same as, as every website you make, you have a new Drupal team. So each would be custom to the, to the client or to the project. Cool, thanks.
Hi. Uh, I take it it's not nope. only for Drupal, yeah? Sorry? I take it it's not only for Drupal. I mean, No, it's, it's an open source platform. Um, so I can use it with any other? Yes. It's a, it's, it's, in effect, it's a static site generator. Um, uh, the version we use, it, the version two of it allows you to use whatever templating language you want. So you can use uh, PHP or you can use Twig or you can use Node or, or whatever. Uh, because of that, then you can, once it's built in um, Pattern Lab, you could use WordPress or Joomla or anything else you want to access. All, all you're doing is accessing basically CSS and uh, CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. So yeah, any, any framework can access it then. Cheers. Thank you. Matthew, one more, Laurie. So I just have a kind of announcement. I have a uh, presentation tomorrow about the state of Drupal 8 frontend, where I will be covering a little bit of like the next steps of this, like how to support this in core, what are the open problems that we have for properly supporting something like this. So it's definitely, if you are interested in implementing something like this with Drupal, it can be interesting presentation to hear about the um, difficulties or the struggles that we currently have with these approaches. I'll be in the front row. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.